The question everybody asks, can you make up sleep? If you only sleep a few hours throughout the course of the week, if you oversleep dramatically on the weekend, can you actually make up for lost time and let yourself recover? Well, I'm going to answer this question and I'm going to reference an awesome study from Penn State later in this video that truly answers it and gives us some good insight. Before I go into that, I want to explain a little bit about what happens when you go into a quote unquote deep sleep and what happens when you go into rapid eye movement sleep. And I also want to debunk a couple of the myths behind that. But first and foremost, if you haven't already, make sure you click below to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and also click on the bell to turn on notifications so you see whenever I go live or whenever I post a new video. All right, so let's talk about sleep for a second. We have two ultimate phases of sleep. Now, if you ask a sleep scientist, they're gonna tell you that there are a lot more, but for the sake of this video, I wanna make it simple. We have slow wave sleep and we have rapid eye movement sleep, okay? Slow wave sleep is where the hypothalamus is basically triggering us to start to fall asleep. The hypothalamus is sort of the epicenter of our brain that dictates whether or not we start to fall asleep or not. And the slow wave stage of sleep is when we lose consciousness and we truly go into the deepest phase of sleep. Then we have rapid eye movement sleep. A lot of people are going to tell you that rapid eye movement is the deepest phase of sleep. And although as far as time is concerned, it usually is the deepest phase of sleep, you're not in that deep of a sleep. Your brain is actually very, very active and not in a state of recovery during rapid eye movement. Your body is generally paralyzed, but your brain is very active. So it's not the best phase of recovery, although it can be very good in terms of physical recovery since your body is very, very still. So what we have to understand is where do the benefits occur? Well, most of the benefits actually do occur during the slow wave sleep. And I'm going to talk about the specific benefits, but I think most of us know what the general benefits of sleep are. Obviously, we want to survive, we want to be able to recover, we want to be able to have better memory, we want things to work, we need to sleep. But there's some interesting things that go along with sleep that you may not have known. So the University of Rochester actually did a study that took a look at deep sleep during the slow wave sleep and how the brain actually cleared out toxins. You see, what happens is when we are in that stage of sleep, our brain cells move further away from each other. So we have these neurons that communicate with one another, brain cells that talk to each other to tell us what to do. But when we sleep and we get into a deep stage of sleep, those neurons separate from each other. Well, that good thing with that means that all the things that need to come in and flush out toxins can actually come in in between the brain cells and sweep out all the toxins and what needs to be flushed out. Therefore, when you're conscious, the brain can actually communicate better those brain cells can talk to one another because there's not as much stuff disrupting the signal. That's pretty darn interesting. Now, additionally, when it comes down to fine motor tasks, very small things that you may not realize are important, the brain has the ability to compartmentalize and categorize those when you're sleeping. Let me give you an example. If you're driving down the road and you learn briefly how to make a subtle movement just to avoid something on the road, it may not seem like a really important thing at the time because it's such a subtle motor skill, such a subtle little hand-eye coordination kind of thing. Well, if you didn't have that slow wave stage of sleep, that small movement wouldn't be able to be put in to long-term memory, meaning you'd have to relearn that task every single time you do it, which would make you very inefficient at avoiding objects on the road. So that's why chronic sleep deprivation makes it so that you don't even remember things that you ordinarily wouldn't remember either way. What I'm saying is you don't know what you don't know. You don't know necessarily that you're becoming more inefficient at things. Sometimes we have this cognitive awareness that we're sleep deprived and maybe we feel stupid or we feel like we're not functioning well, but there's a lot of finite motor skills that we lose that we don't even realize we've lost. Now here's the interesting thing about REM sleep too. Nobody really knows what the benefit of REM sleep is. You see, we have this heightened brain activity. We know certain things go on within the body, but that REM sleep is not the sleep that you're after. It's the slow wave sleep. And each time that you wake up, you're pulling yourself out of that slow wave sleep. So that's the importance of a deep sleep, but that's not the purpose of this video. This video is talking about sleep debt and how you could actually rebuild it or not. But before I get into that, I have one more thing to talk about. What are some of the things as far as body composition, as far as metabolism go, that happens when you are sleep deprived? Okay, number one, your leptin and ghrelin response is going to be dramatically diminished. What that means is your hunger hormones and your satiety hormones are not functioning well. This simply means that when you're sleep deprived, you lose the ability to know when you're hungry or when you're full. This can be extremely detrimental for someone that's trying to, of course, change their body or trying to get in shape. Now, additionally, your insulin levels skyrocket when you do eat. 
So what I mean by this is your body loses the ability to control insulin. So when you do eat, you have a massive influx of insulin, whereas ordinarily that insulin will be controlled a little bit more. And if you've watched my other videos, insulin is the absorptive hormone. It stops you from burning fat. We want insulin levels lower if we essentially want to get in better shape. And then lastly, cytokine levels are diminished, meaning your body lacks the ability to really process inflammation in the way that it should. So let's talk about sleep debt. Sleep debt is essentially the difference between the amount of sleep that you should be getting versus what you are actually getting. An example, again, would be something like if you sleep six hours a night, seven days a week, when you should be sleeping seven or eight, you're gonna be in seven to 14 hours of overall sleep debt. Now what studies are finding is that you don't necessarily have to make up every single hour of sleep. You can have small incremental makeup periods, but you're never going to truly get back everything that you missed. So although you can make up sleep on the weekends, for example, you may not reap all the benefits as if you were to just get the full amount of sleep. But let me first off start by saying the traditional eight hours of sleep is not necessarily true. A lot of studies have found that about six and a half hours is perfectly sufficient for most people. And it really depends on the individual and depends on hormone function. Now, I don't just want you to go out and assume that you can get six and a half hours of sleep, but it's going to leave you a lot less stressed out knowing that you can get by with a little less than what everyone in the media tells you you should be getting. So I wanna talk about a study that Penn State did that specifically took a look at how this worked within the body. So let's head on over to research land and I'll give you the scoop. So this study was conducted by Penn State University and published in the American Journal of Physiology. It was a very broad scale study that really made a lot of headlines when it first came out. What this study looked at was 30 healthy males, okay? And these 30 healthy males, they put through a 13 day sleep study. For the first four days, they had them sleep eight hours. Okay, they wanted to get a baseline. They wanted to see if we had this control, how did their hormone levels look? What did their inflammation look like? What did their attention span look like? What was their mental acuity like? And what were some of the other markers in their bloods like after just having four nights of nice even eight hour sleep? Then after that, they had them go six days with only six hours of sleep. Now granted, six hours of sleep isn't that bad, but compared to baseline, they were essentially in a few hours of sleep debt by the end of the study. So then they got their baseline after being sleep deprived. And what they found is that their inflammatory markers skyrocketed. Their interleukin-6 in particular went through the roof. What does this mean? It means that the body was in a heightened state of immune response, making people very fatigued, making them literally in pain, and making it much more easy to get sick. Okay, they also found, of course, that their attention span diminished significantly, and a multitude of other things. But then what they had them do is they had them go three nights of restorative sleep with 10 hours of sleep. This was essentially simulating a three day weekend where people would sleep in a little bit more. Well, interestingly enough, after three days, inflammatory markers restored back to normal. This is great news. This means that we can bring our inflammatory markers down simply by catching up on sleep. But what was really interesting was that attention span only partially recovered and some of the other biomarkers only partially recovered essentially proving that a long weekend or sleeping in on the weekends is only gonna help you from an inflammatory standpoint. It isn't going to help you too much when it comes down to hormones, when it comes down to cortisol, when it comes down to catechins, when it comes down to anything else that really relates to your memory, your cognition, or your overall mental function. Pretty darn intriguing stuff. Now this is just one study, but there are a multitude of other studies that ultimately found the same thing. Short-term amounts of sleep recovery only help a few biological markers. Over time, we do kill off some of the brain cells. So essentially what you need to do is still focus on making up sleep, okay? On the weekends, you do wanna do that. Inflammation is a big thing within our bodies. But one of the best things that you can start doing is incrementally adding 15 to 20 minutes to your sleep pattern every single day. That's all you really wanna be doing. 15 to 20 minutes is a huge, huge amount in the grand scheme of things. The difference between six hours and six and a half hours is astronomical. So at the end of the day, I know you're all busy people. I know it's not always feasible for you to get eight hours of sleep. I know I can speak from my own personal experience. I sure don't. So six and a half hours is a good number to aim for. Anything less than that, you're definitely going to have a massive increase in inflammation and a decrease in inflammatory cytokines that can help process that inflammation. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. If you have ideas for future videos, make sure you hit them in the comment section below. And as always, I will see you in the next video.